I got into progressive rock at about the same time as I got into video games. I can remember cool fall nights, sitting down after school to play one of my favorite games, Final Fantasy IX. I would usually have the game muted and just put on a Jethro Tull album to create my own soundtrack instead. The bard-like crooning of Ian Anderson on Thick as a Brick seemed like a perfect fit for the game's medieval aesthetic. I came with some preconceived notions about video game music being underdeveloped, especially in relation to Tull's masterful concept albums, and it was a time before many games had full, convincing voiceovers. But eventually I came around to giving the game's own soundtrack a good listen, and I was surprised at what I had been missing out on. Today we're going to talk about video game music. There's a surprisingly rich relationship between progressive rock and video game soundtracks, and this relationship seems to manifest in just about any way possible. There are dedicated game composers who take a strong influence from the genre, musicians who stepped out of the prog world to try their hand at a game's soundtrack, and even video games that feature musicians themselves. We'll take a look at some of the interesting things I found while diving into the subject, and hopefully discover something of a rich, esoteric connection between video games and prog rock. So let's start the discussion with my favorite game series, which you might be able to guess by now is Final Fantasy, and its composer, Nobuo Uematsu. It's nearly impossible to have a discussion about the progressive influences of video game soundtracks without the name Nobuo Uematsu playing a central role to the conversation. Though he wasn't the first video game composer to cite prog rock sources, he has become one of the best known for his role in the Final Fantasy series. Uematsu started out playing keyboards in various bands in Japan, where he picked up a knack for writing songs and cultivated a love for prog rock. あの、そんなにいいかっていうとね、Eventually, he was approached by a friend who developed games for Square, which would eventually become Square Enix, and they needed somebody to write music for their game Cruise Chaser Blasty. This blossomed into a working relationship, and Uematsu stuck around to write the music for the future releases from the company. Square had its issues early on, and by 1987 they were inching towards bankruptcy. So they started development on what they thought would be their last game, hence the name Final Fantasy. Luckily for them and players all around the world, Final Fantasy turned out to be a massive success, and gave Square, including Uematsu, a second chance. From the start of his career as the leading composer for Square, Uematsu had listed bands like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, King Crimson, and Uriah Heep among his key influences. In the early days, the hardware limitations of the Nintendo Entertainment System prevented composers like Uematsu from fully pursuing their more intricate musical aspirations. However, limitations foster creativity. And even with the constraints of the NES, the first Final Fantasy game managed to sneak in some subtle nods to prog amongst its generally classical, Bach-inspired arrangements. <laughs> As the capabilities of gaming systems improved, so did their capacity for more intricate sounds and larger arrangements. The success of Final Fantasy led to a huge number of sequels and spin-offs, with the majority of the main series entrants being orchestrated by Uematsu. The better the systems got, the more he was able to explore progressive musical concepts in the scores, and by the 16-bit era, the orchestrations had reached a much higher standard involving emulating a wider variety of different instruments and allowing for greater freedom. Freedom which Uematsu used to explore more complex part writing, and sometimes using to make pretty clear references to the prog rock greats. <laughs> 
The soundtrack of Final Fantasy VI is widely considered some of Uematsu's greatest work. 1994, the year of the game's release, was an interesting time for video game music. Composers were still held within the limitations that gave classic video games their distinctive sounds, yet allowed for enough freedom to explore music with wider spheres of influence from other genres. Final Fantasy VI would be the last of the series on the classic systems, before the release of the seventh installment on the Sony PlayStation. The enhanced graphics and sound capabilities of the PlayStation would lead to greater changes in the series, both musically and in the gameplay and the stories told by the games. By the time Final Fantasy IX, the last of the PS1 iterations of the series arrived, Uematsu had become a prolific and expert composer. Final Fantasy IX acted as a retrospective of the series up to that point, and many of the tracks on the soundtrack harken back to the early days of role-playing games. Even while expanding the influence of bands like ELP and Genesis in dramatic ways. As the technical capabilities of video game systems became even more enhanced, so did the requirements and expectations for their music. By the 10th installment of Final Fantasy, the demands of composing a fully fleshed out soundtrack for an entire video game had become too much for Uematsu to tackle alone. In terms of the quantity of music required and the amount of work expected in a modern video game, it's a lot for one person to handle. As the series began to include the input of other composers, it still managed to retain the progressive undertones that had come to be expected in not only the Final Fantasy series, but Japanese role-playing games in general. There are many other notable prog-inspired game composers like Motoi Sakuraba from Star Ocean and Valkyrie Profile, and Yoko Shimomura from Legend of Mana and the Kingdom Hearts series, to name a few. <music> to this day, the genre maintains a distinctively progressive flavor, much owing to the works of Uematsu, whose music has now become immortalized by touring orchestras and numerous intricate piano covers. Though there's no shortage of prog-inspired video game soundtracks, we're going to move on to something a little different now. Prog musicians who themselves got involved in video games. There are a number of prog rock musicians who contributed songs or entire soundtracks to video games, but on certain occasions they play an even more central role. Explora 1 Peter Gabriel's Secret World was a multimedia computer game, in part designed by Gabriel himself, and released as a promotion for his 1992 album Us. Though the gameplay of Explorer 1 was a little thin, mostly revolving around puzzles which allowed the player to remix tracks from the album in real time, the game also included interesting backstage videos, interviews, and looks into the production of the album, and even a cameo from Brian Eno. Brian Eno's gonna give you a hand. We'll get into him later. It was an interesting project, but it was overall positively received and its success led to similar games being produced, including Sting's All This Time and another adventure from Peter Gabriel titled Eve. Eve was released in 1996, in the middle of Peter Gabriel's hiatus from releasing albums. The game is an abstract artistic experience, with multiple worlds, each designed by a different artist. Each of the worlds features a song from Gabriel's catalog, including In Your Eyes and Shaking the Tree, which you find instrument by instrument and piece together to create a unique mix of the songs. Eve explores some interesting themes, like the way that people relate to each other and the way that a scientific understanding of the world shapes our journey through life, and the creation of beauty. Well, those are some of my guesses anyway, it's pretty abstract. Regardless, it's a bizarre and thought-provoking experience, and an example of how an interesting project can come about when somebody traditionally outside of the interactive game scene gets a chance to explore their ideas in a new format. The interactive nature of video games can give rise to interesting ways of interacting with the game's music. Sometimes this interactivity can lead to unique and novel ideas, especially when placed in the hands of a master like Brian Eno. 2008, Spore was a video game centered around the idea of evolution. The player starts with a simple, cellular life form which changes and complexifies as the game moves on. 
eventually becoming a highly evolved spacefaring civilization through a process of player-driven adaptation. Brian Eno was given the reins on the game's sound design and wanted to make music to reflect the evolutionary aspect of the gameplay. He did this by utilizing something called generative music design, a process that actually dates back to the 70s and allows music to arise out of systematically generated sounds. Though versions of this process had been used before this point, it was never as fully realized as in Spore. Working with programmers Kent Jolly and Aaron McLearen, Eno developed a piece of software that they called the Shuffler, which allowed for procedurally generated fragments of the soundtrack to be sampled and laid out in a piece of music that was unique in every playthrough, and it was tied directly to the player's playing style. The concept was expounded on by Eno and Will Wright, the game's lead developer, in a really informative lecture at the Berlin University of the Arts, which I'll make sure to link below in the description, and it's worth a watch if you'd like to dive deeper into the concept. Stuart Copeland, the drummer for The Police, which is a band who I would consider at the very least prog adjacent, was hired as composer for 1998's Spyro the Dragon. It's an excellent foray into a progressive jazz fusion sound, a unique and compelling soundtrack that stood out from just about anything else at the time. Spyro is a game where the soundtrack contributed as much to the game's renown as the gameplay. It's inventive, intense, and a demonstration of how rock musicians can successfully cross over into a new area and bring something entirely new to a video game soundtrack. Do you mind not interrupting me when I'm working? Copeland had a particular approach to each level's soundtrack, first playing through the level himself to get a feel for the aesthetics of the environment, the creatures and enemies that inhabit it, and the challenges that a player might face in the level. Each of these aspects informed the music that he would create for the level, and to great effect. The icy levels sound chilly, and the warm levels sometimes have a tropical flavor. Copeland's perspective as a drummer was a unique one for a video game composer with an emphasis on a driving rhythm to keep the player locked into the experience and moving, a nice contrast from the often piano-driven compositions of many video game composers. Being a CD-based platform, the PlayStation also allowed for a wide range of recorded sound samples of orchestral instrumentation, something that is taken for granted in today's technological environment, but was fairly fresh for the time. Copeland would return for the game's sequels, and for the eventual re-release of the original trilogy of games on modern consoles, which included fully remastered soundtracks and even a couple new compositions. Continuing the tradition of prog musicians being involved with video games, 2017's Last Day of June tells a story based off of Stephen Wilson's song Drive Home, which was off of the album The Raven That Refused to Sing. The Raven was a pretty major prog album by modern standards, widely acclaimed and involving the excellent musicianship of guitarist Guthrie Govan and drummer Marco Miniman, as well as the engineering prowess of Alan Parsons and Wilson himself. The game was born out of a collaboration between lead designer Mattia Traverso, Stephen Wilson, and Jess Cope, who had directed the music video for Drive Home and had a large influence on the dark, solemn art style that the game would take on. Both Cope and Traverso had worked with Tim Burton in some capacity, and the influence on the themes and the art direction are fairly noticeable. The game's developers started out with a desire to make a video game for people who say that they don't like video games, latching on to the mature and melancholic storyline of Drive Home and its music video. Traverso noted in an E3 interview that it would be strange to say to someone that you just don't like music, and he wanted to find out why some people had that reaction to video games. The result was the last day of June. In keeping with the theme, the game has a simple control scheme, a mature storyline, and a beautiful art direction, and of course, a soundtrack by Stephen Wilson himself. The game plays like a playable version of the music video that it was based on, with tons of attention put into making sure that every scene had the visual impact of an animated film. It was Wilson's first foray into the world of video games, and his influence made for an exceedingly unique experience and a beautiful, heartbreaking tale of loss. There are many, many more examples of the relationship between prog and video games, 
The tradition continues in games like The Last Day of June and Mars for the Rich, the King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard game that's based off of the song by the same title. There's certainly enough material for a follow-up video or two, but I'd love to hear suggestions, obscure or obvious, that I didn't think about. So if you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe for more progressive rock content. I've gotten so many good bands to cover and different topics to explore, so you can be sure that I'll be back with another band video soon. Thanks for watching.